Welcome back to another episode of Queer Money. Do you ever think to yourself, how am I still in credit card debt? I mean, it's been years, right? You've tried several strategies, right? But it's still there, that annoying debt and those payments month after month after month, stealing from your future. Am I right? Believe me, we understand. Between the two of us, we had credit card debt for a combined total of 24 years. That's ridiculous. That's why we're excited for you to hear today's show. Today, we're talking with Nathan Evans. Nathan and his husband both currently work for the U.S. military in Japan. Nathan's husband's actually a service member. Nathan shares his challenge with debt, how he got into it, and how he's getting out of it, all while living on the other side of the world, far away from home, and while he and his husband are both very focused on their careers. It's important to note that at the time of this recording, Nathan paid off about $9,000 in credit card debt. Nathan recently reached out to us to let us know that he and his husband have now nearly paid off $21,000 in credit card debt. That's amazing. How great for them and how great of an opportunity is that for you? Before we start, today's episode is being brought to you by The 7 Thinking Errors to Financial Freedom. It's a free short ebook that we recently wrote. You see, from our own experiences and by working with current members of the credit card payoff course, we've learned that there are 7 thinking errors, inaccurate beliefs that keep most of us from achieving the financial freedom we all want. However, we define that, whether it's having enough in our savings account or paying off credit card debt. If you're constantly living paycheck to paycheck, stressed about your bills, worried about how you'll make this payment or that payment, there's a good chance you're holding on to one of these thinking errors. Once you identify them, like most financially successful people have, whether they know it or not, then you can change them and your life. So download your free copy of the seven thinking errors to financial freedom at debtfreeguys.com forward slash 166. That's debtfreeguys.com forward slash 166. Now on with Nathan. There's personal finance for the masses. This is not personal finance for the masses. This is Queer Money. All right. So welcome, Nathan, to the show. We appreciate having you. All right. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Absolutely. So would you mind uh, sharing for our listeners a little bit about your financial situation before you started the credit card payoff course? Absolutely. I'd love to. So me and my husband, we joined the military. Whenever he joined the military, we had to take a career change. So we were he had to reduce his income. We were dual income and we went from roughly about six figures all the way down to enlisted pay in an Air Force, which is quite low. <laughs> so we were doing great. We used to live in previous state Alaska and you know, incomes were higher there. And so collectively we were making about one hundred and twenty five a year. And whenever he decided that, you know, he was able to join the military, we took a drastic cut to do so and we knew we would. So we have been always recovering from that moment um, that he joined four years ago. So <laughs> we were still spending like we were making 125 when we were in fact not. So we found ourselves in a, in a bit of a mountain of debt and knew, realized we had to do something quick. Gotcha. Yeah. It, it is hard when you take a pay cut like that to just completely change all of your habits because you kind of have like these behaviors that you've adopted that you could support up until you have a change in pay. And then all of a sudden things have to do like a, a 180 for you. And sometimes you don't adapt as quickly to it. You know, I wonder if even if we were living within our means when we were making that much money, I mean, when I look at the debt that we acquired, I don't ever know that we actually were ever really living within our means. So oh, really? this was even more of a shock to us whenever, you know, when we took that big pay decrease, it was, um, it was a really, it was a big self-realization moment that, okay, we don't have a handle on things. So it was, uh, you know, we were living within our means without, out of our means then. So yeah. it was a really come to Jesus moment when we realized, okay, this is where we are. I often think about much like you guys, whenever you were on your way back, looking at the vacation home <laughs> and you <laughs> talked about your finances, that was kind of a moment that we had as well. And it was, okay, we are, we are in a situation that we need to get out of here. Actually, surprised that you remember that, but glad you brought that story up. Because I, <laughs> I was just going to say that our, our situation was very much the same. We were making decent money. Uh, we weren't by any means wealthy or rich by the amount of money we were making. But it was clear that both John and I were spending way beyond what we were making so that we could live a lifestyle that we felt like we, I don't know, maybe we felt we deserved or we felt we needed to keep up with other people or for whatever Absolutely. reason. 
<laughs> Absolutely. I understand right. completely. Yeah. So um, how did you exactly acquire your debt? Was it simply just living unconsciously, living beyond your means? You know, we have, and during the course that we've taken, there's a lot of things that have really, that we've understood about ourselves. And we had, anytime we would go off to eat with any of our friends or any of my friends all through college, it was, you know, let me pay for it. If there was a night that we would go to the bar or go drinking, I would always be the one to pay. And I felt so fortunate to have, you know, so many friends and it was something that I always felt that I needed to do was to be the caretaker and to, you know, if we would go on a trip, to, you know, to wherever, you know, let me get the hotel. It was always a, a thing that I would do is to always, and, you know, the majority of my friends were freighting and straight in college. So it was, I don't know, realize if it was me trying to buy their love or, you know, to buy their acceptance, but it was something that I've always done. It's really grown. I mean, it's always been a thing that it was just always assumed that I would pay. And I've always, you know, I've always had the funds or the means to do so, but it called up and I can't explain the moment, the psychology behind it, but it mm -hmm. was just something that I've always done. And, you know, when we were living so far from family, we would travel a lot, you know, back and forth to home and stuff and, you know, going out to the nice restaurants and everything's for the Facebook photo. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sure you guys know this. Mm -hmm. Everything you do is, you know, to make sure you've got the, the new Lacoste shirt on and you're checking in at these amazing restaurants and, you know, you're taking this vacation and, you know, staying at this hotel room, that was, that was the life that I had. And it was, I mean, from the outside, man, we had it going on, but right. you know, <laughs> yeah. so we really didn't. I'm curious. Oh, go ahead, David. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I think, you know, I, I'm glad that you, you said that you don't know exactly what the psychological motivation behind the giving or the purchasing or the paying for. I know for myself, one of the things that was very difficult when I started to peel back the layers of what was going on in my life, um, it's hard to look at that and not think to yourself, well, I was just being generous. And that's, I think, what we want other people to think too. Well, and I'm a good person. Right, Absolutely. exactly. And, you know, doing something for your friends makes you feel good. But what's I found so interesting, because I really started to unpack it, um, I did find that there were a lot of times when I was doing things because of insecurities, my own insecurities, that I felt like I needed to pay for my friends, uh, whether it was a round of shots or for dinner or whatever the the case may be. I was I realized that I was doing it because as a young person, I didn't have friends that accepted me. And I then realized that I was using my money as a way to make sure that I was keeping people close to me because I would pay for them. And of course, who doesn't want to be around somebody who's paying for stuff all the time? Of course, right? exactly. And, so, exactly. and also along with that, it was, you know, I come from a super religious family that's not been too accepting of my life choices or, you know, my life in the last couple of years. So it's also a way to say, hey, you know, I'm doing all right. It was right. always to give the air of appearances that, you know, I can be gay and be married to a man and still, you know, I'm doing great. And mm -hmm. that was also a, another part of it was spoiling my parents a little bit and doing things. And, you know, it was all for the appearance and it was all for wanting them to think a certain way when in actuality, it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So you're kind of touching on it now, but to what extent do you think your spending was based on you being a gay man? I always wanted to have, I think there was always this in my mind, and I, I can't explain it. There was always this needing to be bougie or needing to be, you know, accepted and needing to be viewed as successful. And in gay culture, to me, that was what it was growing up. You know, I went to a very private school. I, you know, came from a well-to-do family and all that stuff, but it carried on much more so in the gay community. I always had this thought of Prada shoes and having to go the fancy vacations and, you know, drive the super nice car. It was mm -hmm. it, not only was it the stress of, you know, being a teenager, and being a young man and that kind of stuff. It was always because the gay thing, I always thought I need to spend more and have the nicest brand clothing. And, you know, growing up watching Will and Grace, you know, they've <laughs> always got the Prada shoes and they've always got the nice stuff. So I thought, all right, that's how, that's how I do this. And, right. you know, <laughs> it's, that's not true. It's, Life is not Instagram. Life is not like that. That's not, um, it has taken me well into my 30s to realize that that's not what life is. You know, it's hard focusing on what's a facade and what's not. Mm -hmm. and if you can afford it, nice things are great, but it's mostly a facade sometimes. So I, I'm, I wonder if you'll let me go a little bit deeper. 
where do you think you got the idea of how a gay man is supposed to present himself? Was it just from television or did you have other influences? Yeah. Growing up, there was always, it seemed that I think I caught these habits from other gay men that I had been around. And, you know, in my teens, I think that I had, I don't know if it was just that my individual experiences, but it seemed that every gay couple I was around or gay people, they always had the very nice car. They always had the very nice, you know, they always had it going on in that, mm-hmm. to my viewpoint, I don't know if gay people are just caught in this vicious circle, you know, in my mind that, you know, we're trying to one up each other and it's spiraled. That may not be the case at all. But for myself, that's what it was. And I always just thought that I needed to live to that standard and, you know, try to do that. Right. Yeah. Interesting. I do think that there is, but at least from mine and David's experience, I should say, we do agree with you that there is sort of this mentality in our community that we do all need to live sort of this fabulous lifestyle with the outside display of our our wealth. Absolutely. Obviously, not all gay men are like that, and obviously not all gay circles are like that, but there is sort of this facade that we put on, and we think that one, it kind of stems from a time when being a gay man, you might not live until past your 30s or 40s. Um, so you were living it up. But we also think that it's because we were trying to make up for feelings of inferiority and uh, our own maybe self-loathing, for lack of a better word, trying to let make make other people perceive us as being maybe better than we actually felt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's what it was. It was covering mass, you know, mass insecurities for you know, growing up in a very religious family, there was uh, every day, there was a lot to unpack there. And there is a lot to unpack here. And, you know, once again, my experiences are personal. This is my viewpoint of things, you know, mm-hmm. with why I spent the way that I did. And I'm sure others will differ. But to me, that's how it how it appeared. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, we, we also have to, I think, maybe have to accept the fact that we live in the Western culture where and I think this is creeping into more cultures, but especially here in the United States, that the way you determine whether or not someone is successful is you look at the things that they have. That's just how we measure success. You know, we Absolutely. don't measure success th- that you're the great dad that has the time to spend with your kids. We look at you're the great dad that pulls up in the Escalade and drops your kids off at soccer camp that you just spent $12,000 for two weeks on. <laughs> That's how we measure success. <laughs> and so I, it, it, it's, it's very easy for all of us, no matter who we are, whether you're gay or straight or anything in between, we can all get caught up in that. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons why so much of of our society is tied up in this idea of what our self-worth is, is tied to our net worth. Absolutely. So would you say that it was because you started to see how beyond your means you were living because of being in the military or your spouse being in the military that you then were motivated to do something about your debt? So I think it was a combination of things. We had, it was a combination of the, us losing the massive, you know, the income gap that we had once had. And, you know, as I'm getting older, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in my thirties now and I'm almost in my mid thirties. And with him being in the military, we relocate quite often. And so we had just moved to a, our, our new duty station, uh, located in Japan. And I, I was very fortunate enough to, to find a incredible job. And, you know, we were, kind of looking at the funds and looking at where we were and we're kind of picking back up to where we once were financially and it was okay what do we do in this moment this is we're in a moment where we've got to make a decision Mm -hmm. if we don't get take care of this debt now this will follow us continuously and so our thought was we're going to tackle this now you know when i first start this job so this will be We'll tackle the debt and we'll try to get rid of it before we leave this duty station. So our, well, before we get relocated to our next place, this new station that we're at will be all about fixing our finances and, you know, that's taking control. And actually, that's how I stumbled across you guys was I started researching, you know, money issues, gay people, you know, like money. You know, I was just doing the Google, the Google flu search. And that's how actually I stumbled across the podcast with you guys and started listening and started realizing, oh, you know, not only just taking care of the debt is one thing, but understanding why we got to this place. And I know that's a big part of what we've been reading and going over is let's understand why we're in this situation, because if we don't fix the mentality behind it, we're going to wind up in this spot two years later. Yeah. You could have your own course. (laughs) (laughs) So so first of all, I want to say congratulations on the fact that the two of you 
actually started having the conversation because right. so few couples know how to talk to each other about money without it not turning into war of the roses you know all of a sudden <laughs> they're they're at each other's throats and ready to divorce or walk walk away from a relationship so congratulations i'm, I'm glad you guys did that and i think it's awesome that when you took that step you didn't look for just any other personal finance expert. John, one of the things that John and I say is that it's very difficult to, for the gay community or queer community to find personal finance experts who are part of the community who actually can tell a story that somebody would be familiar with. You know, when you listen to the stories on other podcasts, and I'm just thinking of like, for example, Dave Ramsey, um, Absolutely. it may not resonate. It may not be exactly the same. Now, granted, money is the same for uh, a large percentage of us, but there's those stories behind it. Why do we get into debt that may be a little bit different? Absolutely. It was the, the emotional part, you know, finances are, is a very emotional thing and for me. And, you know, I, I think a large part of it was the psychology and, you know, the gay community and the, you know, the gay angle, which mm -hmm. sounds a very crass way to say that, but it was, it, it was what I needed. It was, that was what we needed to understand is, the psychology behind why we spend the way we spend and the pressures that we felt. And, you know, and until we started going through the course and listening to you guys, it was okay. It, it was a lot of aha moments that have slowly, you know, got us to the point where we feel the way that we are is to start really wanting to tackle and reverse the psychological thinking that we have behind it. Yeah. Thanks, I love well, it. And I'm just going to throw in there, I think that we are different, right? As queer people, we are different. And that for many of us, we need our community. We need to be around our community. But for some of us, it seems like maybe being around our community may be a contributor to our financial situation, good it, and bad. You have, actually, you have actually covered this before. So, you know, whenever you grow up, you know, I grew up in the South. And, you know, you want to move to the big city, so where the gay clubs are and where your people are, right. not your mm -hmm. people, but, you know, where the gay community is, so you can be close to the clubs and the, the bookstores and, you know, around the community. And that was a very expensive thing to move to these large metropolitan, you know, metropolitan area where there was the gay community, where you're not out in the sticks. You know, that alone, that was my first, you know, my first relocation from my parents' home was to move to a bigger city for that reason. Yeah. and. You know, in my hometown, a two bedroom apartment was 600, but, you know, I moved to, the, you know, state capital when it's from the very get go. And yeah. that it has always affected me. It was trying to be around, you know, around those that I have things in common with. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it's interesting that, you know, when we hear stories of a lot of our peers in the personal finance space, they have told stories about how, as a family, they basically kind of left hanging out with a lot of their friends. But as queer people, we have, for sometimes even for our personal safety, we have to be around our queer yes. friends, right? We have to be around our, our community. So we need to figure out how to do it. It has to be a little bit different. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So what has your experience been with the credit card payoffs course so far? So it's been quite well. So the experience we've had is mostly uh, the classes have been helpful for having skin in the game with this debt tackle was kind of our get-go with this and having the constant reminders you know we are involved in the facebook group that you guys have we have the podcasts that are available to us and we have the course so what i wanted the most is something to stay on track and to stay on top of and with you guys having you know like the weekly pet the weekly videos that i have to go back and listen sometimes because the time differences but you know with having the classrooms and the ability to reach out that's been wonderful to help me to stay on target, to keep it at the forefront of my mind. The classes have been helpful. We have actually we used the pay down calculator. We, who's done the snowball method and from actually we've the numbers here, we started the program on January 24th and we had actually on that day, we started around with $55,200 in debt. And actually as of this week, we've paid down around 10,000 of the debt so far. Nice. And the difference between this, you know, these numbers sound great. And I can tell you what we would have done a year ago is, all right, we would have paid the minimums or maybe $100 more than the minimums. And we would have taken that extra, you know, $1,000 from our paychecks and we would have went out and had a wonderful time and, you know, may have went on weekend vacations or, you know, with and traveled with it. But now that our focus is so on 
getting out of debt, the program has actually helped us reshape our thinking and saying, you know, it's not, oh, how much money do we have to go play with this week? It's how much money can we put on debt this week? <laughs> you and sound like David that, and I used to sound. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. Well, how much money do we have? Let's go to Tokyo Disney or, you know, let's do something here. So it's absolutely changed our mindset of how we spend. And the, the budget calculator was, uh, the budgeting, I think that was uh, section one was super helpful. And, uh, spending you know, analysis. some things we, yes. And yeah. some things we worked and you, like you guys have said, we, we adjust the, the class to kind of fit our needs with the spending analysis was wonderful and it did help us realize some things. And as far as the budget comes, our budget that we've come up with is $300 a week to spend. Like that's our spending money. And it's because of this, you know, we now have a handle on our finances and, you know, we have $300 a month to live our week to live on. This is our going out to eat money. This is our grocery money and that's it. And then after it's gone, that's it. We don't use the credit card and, you know, we'll just put ourselves back in the hole. So it's, yeah. it's completely changed our focus and kept us on track, you know, for these couple months now. Nice. That's awesome. So you said you started off with 55,000 and you're probably down to about 45,000 now. Yes. Just the simple fact that you've paid off that 10,000. Could you give us maybe an idea of how much money do you think you're going to save in either to this point or maybe even this year? It will be significant. With the credit card interest alone, we did not even realize the interest that we were paying per month. So there was one card, I think it was like a PayPal credit card. or It was something insane with the amount of interest that we were paying. And from paying off that card alone, I think it literally has saved us like $180 in three months because wow. we had this high balance on this card that 22% or 27%, it was insane. So, I mean, the savings have already calculated, I mean, without the numbers in front of me, I, I know for a fact it's over $400 just in these three months that we focused our payoff plan. And that was the other thing. We did not even know how to begin to tackle the debt with us breaking it down into, you know, the methods that you guys have and mm -hmm. stuff. It was say, okay, you pay this off first and then look at the money that you've got left over. We never did that before. It was never a, it sounds so obvious, but it's, uh, I mean, by the end, by the time this is all by the time we get to the end of the year, I mean, it will be, I think it was like $3,800 of what we'll save, you know, just on, I think it's my credit cards alone wow. of my debt that I have. So it's significant. Right. How many <laughs> times can you go to Tokyo Disney with $3,800? I know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, part of the classes, it's prepare for setbacks. You know, when we had started this in January, we were you know, within 12 months, we will be debt free and their life has happened. I mean, there has things that have happened. We've had a dog that's gotten sick. We've had to replace an air conditioner in the car and, you know, things have happened. And so we've had to adjust our timeline of getting debt free. We're still within our goal of 18 months now. So originally we started out with 12 months and, you know, we needed a more attainable goal and a more, instead of a militant style, we've had to relax a little bit to prepare for mm -hmm. life occurrences. But so far, I mean, it's been it's been great, and we're looking towards the finish line now. And, and the fact that we've got a finish line in front of us now is something we've never had. Nice, that's awesome. I can't wait to see all the gifts in the credit card payoff group, <laughs> and you start paying off your debt. <laughs> exactly. <That's awesome. laughs> that was one of the first messages I sent you. I said, if you save us six thousand a year, what do you take as payment? So, <laughs> <laughs> right. so uh, having taken, or you know, you're still going through the the course. What has sure. um, what surprised you most about the course? itself or what you've learned about yourself or your spending what's kind of shocked you the most so far the individual how we spend the money you know how we've got into our how we've got ourselves into the situation once we started you know the spending analysis and once we started you, you know for the first month it wasn't let's not really watch it we're just going to spend as we normally do and it's incredible how much we would spend on the most mundane things i mean like the apple app store i think we'd spend like 65 dollars and you know within a month's time and for what you know it's absolutely nothing for these games that we play on a phone that you know we we just didn't think about how things add up whether it be coffee or whether it be you know it's let's have stuff delivered to our house that costs an extra 12 dollars for food when you know the restaurant's two feet down the road you know <laughs> it's the little things that add it up and like you know holy crap, we're, it just adds up to be a lot. And mm -hmm. it was just being self-aware of where we spend money that has honestly has changed the game for us. Yeah, it is. It is 
always an eye opener, I think, when people take the time to to do the analysis, to sit down and say, where am I really spending my money? How much am I spending on this or that? When you think you're spending a certain amount and then you realize or you see the numbers that show you're really spending twice, three times, four times, I think one of the biggest surprise to John and me when we did that spending analysis is here we were spending all sorts of money having a really good time. But at any moment, if you had asked us, are you having a good time? Do we love our lives? Are we, do we feel like we're living fabulously? We would have told you no. But our spending habits probably would have told you the opposite. <laughs> you know, this kind of goes back to what we had stated earlier. As far as the, the concept of money and having money, spending the psychology for me was you know well it's all right i make seventy thousand a year i could i can buy this i can afford this and it, it, when we were making the you know when we were making over six six figures a year it was oh you know we make 120 a year we can let's just buy the shirt or you know that was the psychology is well you know we make this amount of money it, it doesn't matter we can afford this we, we are at the pinnacle you know we make this much we can afford it what i never processed was okay we make this much money this is what the paychecks are. You know, if we make 60000 a year, our paychecks after insurance and stuff comes out is, let's say, $1,500 a month. Well, out of that has to come so many things. And I know that sounds crazy, but, you know, we were making 100 and some thousand a year, but it never broke down to the, the finances of it. Like, well, how much things cost and mm-hmm. how much are we really spending on things? It was, we never took into the big picture of yes, we are making this much money, but this is how it breaks down. And this is where your money needs to go to pay off debt. It, it never clicked for us. I, I never had that moment of, yes, we're making this much money, but this is what the paycheck is. And this is what has to come out of it. And that sounds so simple and so basic math, but it never clicked. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And that's why for so many people, not everybody, but for so many people, it, it's, it's how you spend your money that determines your financial security. It's not how much income you have. And so many of us are, are, are f- so focused on our income and trying to earn more income. But unless you fix the, the budgeting, um, unless you're a little bit more conscious of your spending, you're, you're, you know, how much you earn is not going to make you financially solvent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So maybe it's going to be going to endless trips to, to Tokyo Disney, but what do you plan on doing with all your money when you're finally debt free? <laughs> you know, I cannot even, uh, obviously to, to, I mean, to start focusing on retirement and start putting more in then, uh, you know, of course the travel thing, we, we love to travel and I have no idea. Honestly, it's just, uh, once we get, get the debt taken care of, it will truly be, I think we'll probably live the same lifestyle we, we have, but we'll actually start using cash, which is a revolutionary concept for us. <laughs> so, you know, well, that's... you'll save more, even more money when you do that. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. I, I don't see for anything changing drastically other than just using cash instead of a credit card. So. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Or credit cards nice. with cash, sorry. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, again, I, we've told you this before. Thank you so much for, for taking the course. Dave and I have thoroughly enjoyed working with you. Um, and uh, we're excited to see the progress that you're, you're making. And uh, we can't wait for a year or so from now when, when it's all paid off and we can all celebrate. Maybe maybe we have to make a trip to Dis- to, uh, to Tokyo to celebrate <laughs> yeah, with them. Exactly. Absolutely. That, that would be wonderful. Tokyo <laughs> Disney was, that would be a wonderful trip for all. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. We appreciate Thanks, it. Nathan. Absolutely, guys. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Nathan, thank you so much for sharing your personal and private story with us and the Queer Money listeners. It takes a brave soul to do that, and it takes a caring soul, because we have no doubt that your story and experience will inspire others to pay off their credit card debt too. If you, our listeners, are struggling with credit card debt or other financial stress, don't forget to download your free copy of The 7 Thinking Errors to Financial Freedom. If you find that day after day, week after week, year after year, you're always in the same financial condition, there's a good chance you have one of these thinking errors. Once you identify them, like most financially successful people have, then you can change them and your life. So don't wait. Download your free copy at debtfreeguys.com forward slash 166. We'll talk with you next week.